because it seems like everybody runs in the back of Vince Freeze these days. Everybody getting freeze, and Vince ain't doing nothing. He just out there. He probably just trying to stay out of the way, and he's freezing people. In in the past, I think he would have won that race. I think he would end up like beating Cooper. I think the reason I say that is because he knew if, I mean, can you imagine? Like if he would have came back and won that race, the message that it would have sent to everyone else in that field. Like, yeah, it sent like, okay, he might be back. He's feeling pretty good. Eli's saying like, I'm tired of being the old guy. I ain't never called you the old guy. Like, hey, hey, I ain't gonna disrespect you like that. I don't know why I did that. It's like a Spider-Man thing. Should we go into 250 class? What's up, guys? You know who it is, your boy JS7, and we back. We back at the Rewind, baby. They've been off for a week, and they finally back. I don't know what y'all been doing, but I've been missing the Supercross. I've been missing watching these boys go at it, and they went at it in Jerry's World in Dallas, Texas, one of the most iconic stadiums in the world. So every chance we get there, see that big old TV screen, see all the people, everything just bigger in Texas. The racing was just as big. Oh, my. And it was excited to see those guys. They were happy to be back. We were happy to be back. Round seven from Jerry's World, Dallas, Texas. You know what we're going to do. So let's do it. So that being said, in the biggest stadium, one of the biggest stadiums they go to all year, it was a short lap time. And usually when you get the short lap times, you have a track that's super tight. Um, and it was it was small, but it wasn't tight. I mean, they actually had some room. That track was pretty high speed. I think that's where the lap times came from. Um, once they landed off the finish line, you know, they had that on off, which is more of a almost a I wouldn't even say a speed check because those guys are basically just holding a wide open, um, doing that on off across the mechanics area into that sand section. So track was short, but it was really high speed. There were some tricky parts where Austin Forkner goes down, um, but it was really a track that what I noticed was the dirt. The dirt seemed really Florida-ish like, um, like they had a lot of sand. And I remember back in the day when we used to go to Dallas, it used to be blue grooved. And over the years, it started getting more traction into it. But this year, it actually looked really loose. So um, didn't say much about anything that stood out on the track rather than it was the dirt. And then it was also a track that if you used your line set up properly, like you setting up one corner, if you notice a lot of passes like we're going where – guys are coming in a bowl corner they would cut down the other guy would ride around the outside which would carry momentum more momentum going into the the next section and be down on the inside so it was a track that you could pass if you set things up but I guess the track was just overall another supercross track layout high speed but the action was intense and that's all we needed to see so after the weekend off you had last time they raced Kenny Roxon was dominant kickstart Kenny wins and we talked about how certain tracks and the track being very, uh, you have to put that track together. It helped Kenny out because he's, he's great at that. But that there was a lot of questions that we were still kind of being waiting, waiting for. It. Everybody was super close after six rounds. And what we saw this year, we saw Chase Sexton be able to get a, a race win, but he's still missing that speed. And then we saw when it seems like Jet Lawrence should be winning more of them, but he was still making mistakes that we didn't see him make at all last year. But when he was out front, he was able to win. And then we've had questions about Eli Tomac. Well, okay, last weekend at, um, or two weekends ago at Phoenix, was he starting to come back? Because it got rough for, you know, a couple of weeks there, but was he starting to trend back? So after the week off, there was a lot of questions and, and um, answers that we wanted to figure out. Would Kenny Roxon be a championship threat? And I feel like if he was, this weekend coming into Dallas was a huge weekend for him. You have to think that he had a lot of confidence, the way he rode and the way he was able to just kind of run away from those guys. If he was able to come back and solidify that this weekend, then I think it would change our whole narrative about Kenny. Um, but he obviously had some some issues, uh, say maybe rode too much or whatever it was, but it didn't come to fruition for him. And then Jet Lawrence, would he 
basically come after that weekend off and say, you know what, like now I got everything situated. We got in the groove. And when I'm out front, you guys can't beat me. And we saw a lot of stuff happen. So this weekend was a, a really big weekend for a lot of those guys. And I think we leave the weekend in the same position that we started the weekend. Come on, man. Obviously, Jet Lawrence is really good. And yeah, I would say he's probably the most overall around it. He's probably the best, the fastest, but then he has these mistakes. And then we got Cooper Webb. He's still Cooper Webb. Like, you know, the guy ain't fast, but he's fast. And like a couple weekends ago, he was up front and went backwards and he didn't have pace. And then this weekend he was up front and then went forward and he ended up winning the race. And then we had Eli. Eli came back. He was almost beat mode. I ain't going to say full on beast mode, but he was, he was coming back and we'll get into him. So I feel like going into Daytona, we had the same questions that we got going into Dallas. I can't wait. Uh, yeah, just got caught off guard, you know, sometimes, sometimes you're the hammer, sometimes you're the nail and uh, I end up nailing that tough blocks. So Jet Lawrence, the night started off, started off right. I mean, he was able to get him a heat race victory, little chaos going on, little um, Jason Anderson, and we had the fever. People was getting sick out there because Mookie Fever showed back up, which is good to see. And it kind of brought me back to the old school, what happened a couple years ago with Malcolm and uh, Jason, you know, being there together. But they had another, another issue. It was the 18. So, yeah, a lot of stuff was going on in that heat race. Jason Anderson out front, Jet comes in, um, racing incident jason cuts down jet runs into him jason cuts him off because he's upset you know how elmer humbre is in his airspace he's gonna shoot you but i think that was clearly a racing incident jet was trying to come in and like run it in on jason but he wasn't trying to actually run run in on jason if that makes sense and then allowed um my brother to get past and then they kind of went back and forth but jet the difference to me from this weekend and what we saw even outdoors the way he rode that heat race was kind of the way you expected him to be able to ride basically all year long. All these things are happening, but he just kind of sits back, regroups, and he's able to make his way back up. And I think for him, um, you know, there's these guys are good, and there's a lot of other things that's happening, other things that are causing him to maybe make some mistakes and, and whatnot. But overall, the night started off good for him. He was able to get through that heat race, and then he was out front in the main event, and it looked like Jet Lawrence was going to, kind of do what Jet Lawrence was going to do. I believe his only problem was, was the guy that became his problem, and that was the guy in second. I think if anybody else was in second, I think Jet would end up winning that race. I don't think the, the fact is, is when he pulled away, and I believe if it was Chase, when you race guys, you kind of get know their tendencies. So you know, okay, all right, at this point of the race, all right, if I got Ken behind me, if he hasn't caught me by now, he, he ain't probably going to catch me because that would be doing something that he normally doesn't do and come in a late charge. And the way Eli's been riding all year, you know, like or maybe Beast Mode, he, he could come back, but I haven't really seen it. And then, all right, Chase, again, I've, I've been there, done that, so I know. But Cooper Webb, you just know, dang, he's still within five seconds and it's 10 minutes into it. And I think that changes a lot of things. And as I said, I believe if it was anybody else besides Cooper Webb, not saying that Jet made a mistake because of Cooper Webb, but I don't think I don't think he would have been in that situation. I think the the way um, the the way Jet rides and the him knowing kind of the surroundings. Again, I don't think he I don't think he would have been in that spot. Period. So because it was Cooper Webb, I believe ends up catching off Jet, and then he goes down. And then the race is on. And I also believe because Cooper Webb was in second, he's really the only guy that can inherit a lead and feel like it's kind of like the Brinks truck a couple weeks ago with RJ. You're going to open the truck. All the money is going to fall out. Well, Cooper Webb believed that money was his, like the money that was in his truck, that was his money to start with. So my point is when he inherited that lead, he's like the one rider that was feel like, well, I've been the best all night. Like I, you should be behind me. And he can handle that pressure to where 
he wouldn't feel like, okay, I just got a gift that this guy's actually catching me back up and he's probably just going to pass me because he's the best guy anyway. Cooper Webb don't think that way. He's think he's been the best. He let Jet go out because he knew Jet was going to fall and Jet did what he thought he was going to do and Cooper's back where he belongs and Jet was going to have a hard time um, trying to pass him. That's why I think the next mistake ends up happening with Jet uh, for two reasons. Bike set up and then also because it was Cooper Webb uh, being just so stubborn. So the first crash, you can almost, it, it's a weird, it's a weird thing to say because it, it looks like, okay, when you get in those, those rhythm sections, you know, a bike's being a little bit stiffer can obviously it allow him to build a not have the thing bottom off and shoot off. The problem is like with those G outs, once that bike gets bottomed out, it's kind of like, you know, um, if you ever been on a, a, um, a rod in an in a th amusement park, the ones that spin, the, the gravity, where you get kind of stuck on against the wall, like the gravity. Well, when you get in those hard G outs, once that bike gets bottomed out, whatever way you're kind of leaning, that's the way the bike's going to go. And so saying that, you would think that the bike could be too soft. And once he gets in there, it bottoms out, he's got his weight, and it can shoot off. Well, I believe what happens with Jet, we've been talking about his bike being stiff, and I know this because this is one of the issues that I have in section, particular parts of the sections in um, the rhythm sections. When you get a bike that's actually too stiff, where I feel like what ends up happening with Jet, like he jumps over that backside of that tabletop. And what happens is like the, bot the bike bottoms out. And because it's so stiff, it actually starts rebounding. The one part with a stiff motorcycle, and especially a front end, the front end starts rebounding up. So I believe what's ended up happening Jet goes over the backside of that tabletop. He gets in. The back end stays somewhat down. The front end starting to push back up, which pushes more weight on the back end. And he's leaning or not properly, I guess, um, aim where he wants to go. It's easy for him to just jump off the racetrack. And all that's caused because it could be because the bike lands in there. And because his motorcycle is stiffer than most guys, the thing starts shooting back and his weight's not properly and he's shooting towards the popcorn stand. Emotional, damn it! And he jumps off the racetrack. So as you would think that it would be too soft, it actually could be the opposite where a bike could be too stiff that can actually cause that crash. But going to the flip side, what we saw with Austin Forkner, because his bike is stiff, allows Jet to do exactly what Austin did, come up short on the backside of that tabletop. But because the front end rebound so quickly it allows him to just keep pushing through the um pushing through the rhythm section and not have his hand blow off the difference between those two is because one is at a slower pace which is why he ends up kind of jumping off the track you look at that that was a slower part of the rhythm section it was more in the beginning where the other one he actually is going in really fast and i think that's why one can work in one area and the other one can't so again the mistake was a simple racing mistake. We saw what happened. Malcolm jumped off the track last year. Guys do that. But a lot of times when you look at Jet, I know Jet would go back and you'd be like, yeah, the thing's coming back up at me and I'm not properly lined up. I'm going to jump off the racetrack. It is a racing thing. And it's just something that you really don't think about um, until it happens. And you go like, damn, damn, it got me. So that one was, again, racing. The next one is somewhat of the same deal we talked about um the thing was it was like it looked like jet just ran into the dude like when he was trying to catch him past cooper webb it looks like he just runs into the dude but well, technically he does just kind of run into the dude but what's end up happening when you watch jet go through that um that whoop section as he's on the gas his bike is okay like it looks fine as he starts getting off the gas if you notice the bike start dancing around so jet doesn't have a choice like he really can't get off the gas which makes him have to stay on it because the bike's dancing around you got cooper webb on the right side of you trying to close you down and this lapper in the front of you so as simple as it looks um we're like dang why didn't you just slow down where well, he tries to do that the back end starts dancing out so he gets on the gas and then he ends up running in the back of the dude so that was just caused by again kind of a bike setup same thing we were talking about in anaheim with him but overall, those crashes were something that I would say Jet's not going to change his motorcycle. I don't even believe that there's some problem that he should change it to avoid those crashes. 
I just think the situation, and again, Cooper Webb kind of being there and where he was in the race, like he had to make the choice. But before people say like he kind of lost his mind and he just ran into the back of the dude, well, there's a little bit more into it than just that. Um, but he just kind of lost his mind, ran in the back of the dude. But, you know, Jed, he all right. He all right. I think for him, he was bummed. Of course, I think for us, probably the best thing that happens, like, all right, just makes the racing more interested. But I think Jet Lawrence is fine. And, um, you know, I think this weekend with Cooper, with Tomac and Jet, I think he'll be back for vengeance. And I think we're going to have a great race at Daytona. So why going into that whoop section, he could see Freeze up ahead. Why doesn't Jet drift over a little bit to try to jump in behind Cooper? Well, part of the reason why he doesn't jump in behind Cooper is because Jet was blitzing those whoops and he knew the way. So what is up? What guys were doing all day long, if you watch the passes going in the whoop, so when they get in that bowl corner, the passes would be made because the guy would end up staying on the outside, usually the guy in the second. The guy on front would end up cutting down and hitting that double and then jumping through the whoops because most guys that cut down and squared that corner up and doubled into the whoops, they jump through it. The guys that actually rail the outside, they kind of blitz through the whoops. So the point is, Jet was on the outside and he knew – if he can get up close to um, Cooper, his momentum will carry around the outside, which means he would hit that double lower, which means he would actually get in the whoops faster. His goal was to be able to beat Cooper and at least get side by side so he can actually cut Cooper off to where Cooper wouldn't be able to cut back underneath him because he's got that lap rider to kind of help him a little bit. And he just needed to be on his the, um, beside Cooper so he doesn't jump in behind him because he would just ran in the back of him and he wasn't going to jump through the whoops. So the reason he doesn't do that is because he knew that was the only way he could make that pass. The problem, once he committed coming out of that corner to hit that double and blitz those whoops, he was all in. Like there was nobody really blitzing the whoops and then slowing down to build a double, and especially when he was trying to make that pass. So I think it just came down to freeze wasn't even an issue in the beginning part. He wasn't even really concerned about Vince freeze. He was more concerned about trying to beat Cooper and get side by side so he can cut Cooper off because the guys that were jumping the whoops wasn't jumping across. And the reason Jack couldn't cut back across through the whoops and funnel in once he got into it is because usually once you have a stiff motorcycle and you're starting to blitz through the whoops, um, you, you can't like maneuver your way around. Once you blitz into it, you're kind of committed. Um, and I think that, that was the, his problem where he ends up running in the back of the dude. He was just stuck and... He ends up running back at freeze, and the race was over for him. So do you think Cooper heading into the whoops kind of was being strategic about that and kind of knew, like, all right, as long as I'm alongside Vince here, like, Jet will have nowhere to go? Or is he is he thinking like that going in? That's a great point. And, yes, I do believe Cooper felt like when Jet wasn't worried about Vince freeze, because if he was worried about him, then I don't think he would have blitzed in those whoops. Because, for instance, if Jet was thinking about Vince freeze – then he wouldn't have been trying to pass Cooper. He wouldn't have blitzed through the whoops because he knew his pace was probably going to run in the back or get really close to him, and he would have been in a spot like he was. So if Jet Mindset was thinking about Vince, then I don't think he would have tried making that pass there. Where Cooper Mindset was, I'm going to get out of this corner and double, and I'm going to use Vince because I believe if I can get through the beginning part of his whoop, Jet's going to have to make a choice. He's going to end up running back of Vince Freeze because Vince is starting to slow down and let me know. So you had two riders, one not worried about him and the other one worried about trying to use him to end up making Jet do what he ended up doing. So um, I believe, yeah, Cooper did use that because ultimately if Vince wasn't there, Cooper, I believe, would have went outside. I think Cooper would have went and went in Jet's line. And even if he ended up doubling or, um, you know, jumping through the whoops, he wouldn't leave that door open. The fact is, he saw people getting past there, and usually people got past pretty early going into the whoops. So I believe if Vince wasn't there, Cooper wouldn't have made that choice. He would have rode that outside because Jet then, nobody would have actually pass Cooper if Cooper was on the outside. He would have had too much speed, and he literally probably could have rolled through those whoops. Jet wasn't going to go to the inside and blitz those whoops fast enough to pass Cooper. So, um, the line selection to me says that Cooper was aware about Vince Freeze and knew by going inside and doubling that Jet Lawrence was going to be in a spot at the end of those whoops, which he ended up there. So, yeah. 
I'm just I'm sick of people calling me the old guy. So uh, I'm just warming up. I'm getting better. I'm coming. So I'm ready to get going. And uh, yeah, second will do for tonight. So Eli Tomac, is he back? Is Beast Mode back? I think he's getting closer. I think he's being closer. Now, Eli, I've been saying all year long, the difference that I see with Eli this, uh, this year compared to years past, it's, it's not a, a speed thing. Um, and it's not because he ain't trying. We see at Anaheim and when Eli is kind of in that, when things are going right for Eli, he can beat anybody. Like, he, he can beat anybody. I mean, he did it a few weeks ago. I mean, nothing looked different. I said between those all three of those races, he looked the same. It was just one, he got out front, and he was comfortable. And where the other one, he was in the pack. And when you're in the pack, you got to make those decisions on being comfortable, but then being uncomfortable because you got to make up time and go around people. Well, this weekend, we saw Eli Tomac in that heat race. I think the track was set up perfect for him. It was a fast track. Had some bull corners. It looked awesome, by the way, uh, being first in the heat race. Track was smooth, kind of like it was at the farm, kind of somewhat like it is in Colorado. Have that loose dirt, but it's hard underneath. I think conditions that Eli is comfortable, unlike where it's slippery like a, um, like a Tampa or something, where it's that hard, slippery, the shiny stuff where you – you know, it's like a hard base where this had a hard base, but it actually had like sand on it. So anyways, the track looked comfortable. Eli looked comfortable and you can see him every lap, like just getting more confidence. And I think he was, when you're, when you won as many races and you're Eli Tomac, the one thing I said that we all feared with Eli was speed. It was a speed thing. So if he doesn't have that, then you're taking something that makes Eli, Eli, you know, we all know he's in shape, but I think most of these guys, they're all in shape. The reason Eli has been so dominant and been so uh, like feared by most guys is because he's fast. He, like he can go faster than anyone. And then he can do that longer than anyone, which makes him like deadly because you just know, like, unlike Cooper Webb, Eli can do be in that same spot, and you know back in the day, like, he can click, and all of a sudden, he could just go two, three seconds faster, and you know he's in shape, so you're not like you're going to outlast him by uh, conditioning. He just, once he gets started, he can't be stopped no matter what. Well, this year, we saw the Eli of the past a little bit where he would get started, and then he would stall his motorcycle. Like, you can hit the kill switch. Like, you can stop him, like the Eli in the past, like, Look, dude, he can come up and pass you, but you got you to gotta get in front of him. You got to throw up, you know, naked lady waving a sign, whatever it is. Like, he would take his eyes off, and then you can, you can run with him. For a while there, last couple of years, nothing was stopping him. So this weekend, as you can see in the heat race, it was starting to come back. He was starting to get spunky. He was starting to throw whips. And where Eli was, he talked about he wanted to work on coming at the exit of the corners. That was where he was losing his speed, uh, losing his time. Where well, actually where Eli was really fast at was entering the corner. And that was, to me, was a signs of beast mode because it's kind of like RJ in the whoop. It's like he had no respect for him. Like he was jumping into the corners. Forget landing on the backside of his double. I'm going to jump into it. I'm going to jump into the corner. And technically, it actually worked really well because it actually made the bike have one motion instead of having, if you land on the backside, it's going to go down, then go up, then hit the ball corner. Eli was just making one. So it was fast in general. But my point is, you can start to see it come back. And then the main event happens. And then he goes down. And he ends up coming up through the pack like we've seen Eli in the past. But he does it a different way to me. When I watch Eli, it looked like he got up and was probably pretty bummed out because he was probably feeling pretty good after that heat race win and being able to um, beat Aaron. But even in that heat race, as good as he was, it didn't look like, I mean, he just didn't run past Aaron. Aaron had a lap route that he thought was going to do something or, you know, he's seeing colors, whatever, and he ended up getting past. But he, Eli was feeling good. Well, the main event goes, he goes down, and he gets up, and it just looked like he just started riding, and he was like 46s, whatever, you know, making his way up to the pack. But it looked like he was just, 
as the laps was going on, he was like catching people, but he was doing it in a way where it was kind of like what I was saying this year. Like when he's comfortable, he can outrun anyone. And I think it wasn't like how he was riding the heat race. He wasn't whipping it. It wasn't beast mode. Eli was had a pace. His bike looked good. And I think as the laps were going on, he was just getting more confidence and just kind of felt like he can run this pace and it wasn't a lot of chances. And I think as he kept coming up and as he started catching the guys up front, then, of course, you pass somebody that you just got past. Like he passed Justin Cooper. Justin Cooper has been passing him. What we've seen when he's going from like third to 11th, we saw Justin Cooper pass. We saw the guys passing him. So for him to pass him was another confidence boost. So you throw a whip. And I think it was more about Eli just being comfortable and that pace, being able to run that pace at um, really easy. And I think he just stayed the same where other guys started dropping off. So I think the part where people get confused, all of a sudden this beast mode, like he went way faster. I think Eli was running the same pace. And as by him running that, obviously you guys are starting to drop off because Cole, we would show him in lap times. You know, most of those guys are in 45s at, you know, till lap 16. Well, Eli was in the 45s until lap like 23. But in the beginning part of the race, like Eli was like 46s, 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 46s. So he got up, ran a pace. And before you start saying like, oh, it was because he was in lap traffic. What I'm saying is if if Eli is going to be fully back, it's going to be because of like this weekend. What we saw him be able to do, um, I think it's just mentally going to help him confidence to believe that even if he's not in full beast mode, I believe this helps him a lot. And then going to Daytona, it couldn't come at a better time. And I was telling Cole off the camera that the way Eli rode, it was almost like when he got up, I think it was like him being out front. Like it was like him pulling the whole shot being out front. And the reason I say that is because when he got up, if something would have went bad or he was uncomfortable, I don't think Eli would have came up clearly like he wouldn't have been able to come up i think he got up and then just started rotting he's probably bummed out and just started rotting and realized like dude i'm actually catching these people and then he just kept going and kept going which is like how he did a few weekends ago at anaheim when he had that 10th place in those like he was riding good and then that triple crown like he was riding good and then he just got stuck behind those guys and even though he was faster he just got stuck there and then he just went backwards where when he got out front, he was like, okay, I'm waiting for those guys to catch me. They ain't catching me. All right. This like, I could do this. I could do this. And then he just started. Then no one was going to catch him because he got comfortable. Well, my point is it's like when he went down, it was like him getting a whole shot where things were, he was in his own zone kind of in the sense, like nothing was getting in his way. He was able to pass guys. And he was able to do it like he was leading the race, dictating, and he was making his way up. And then at the end of the day, like he was able to get second. And the reason I say that is because I believe Eli, in in the past, I think he would have won that race. I think he would end up like beating Cooper. I think the reason I say that is because he knew if, I mean, can you imagine? Like if he would have came back and won that race, the message that it would have sent to everyone else in that field like, yeah, it sent like, okay, he might be back. He's feeling pretty good. Eli's saying, like, I'm tired of being the old guy. I ain't never got you the old guy. Like, hey, hey, I ain't gonna disrespect you like that. But nonetheless, like, it's like I'm starting to get back. Well, if he would have came back and won that race, then it wasn't I'm starting to come back. I am back. I am back. And all the stuff you would 100% believe that it was the bike. It was the bike. You just see what dude did. It was the motorcycle. The fact is... And I think he would have just mentally turned it up even another notch. And again, the reason I go back to and I say it was like Eli leading and like he was kind of dictating the race because usually when guys are out front dictating the race, they don't all of a sudden start going like three seconds faster. Why? Because they're already leading. So their pace is already good enough. And until somebody challenges them, that's how fast they're going to go. Well, when Eli caught up to those guys, Eli in the past would have probably made that decision and be like, you know what? I'm going to go a little bit faster and I'm comfortable going that fast because what I'm doing right now, yeah, I'm clearly faster, but there's the beast mode level, which I can run. And to me, I didn't see that. 
And I, it's not a knock, not at all, because I think what Eli did is the right thing in the sense of where he's been at a couple of weeks. I think this is the best thing for Eli. But what, before people start saying like he's 100% back, I still feel like there's another level that Eli, when Eli's in that zone, there's another level to it. And I don't think we saw that level yet. And hopefully for all the guys racing him, that they don't see that level. I know when Eli is, guys, guys get bad starts. Guys come up. We've seen that. Like, we've seen guys come from the back and come up to podiums. But when we say beast mode, when we talk about Eli Tomac, we talk about certain guys, when they do certain things, you realize that that's different. Like, no, 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 no. No one's beating him. And when I feel like when Eli's getting in that zone, you can stamp it up. No one's beating him. In Salt Lake City a few years ago in Kawasaki, you saw the difference. Like, he was coming up. It didn't matter who was in front of him. He was going to the front, and he looked like he was going to the front. Or this one looked like Eli was going to the front, but it looked pretty easy to him. And when he got to the front, I just think, again, um, Eli in the past probably would have won that race because of – not because he would have tried harder or anything, but because he knew by winning that race what that would have done, and especially being 17 points back. I think Eli got up. Once he started catching those guys and he got to the podium, it was like he won that race to him. And mentally, the way the last couple of weeks were, it was like Eli, in his mind, like he won that race. And I think that's the difference. And so I believe Eli is still on that same line. And the reason why... I say that is because of all the things I've just said, but I think the champ is being close. And if anything, you can bring him back. I know how good that dude is. And that's why I always said, like, it ain't because he ain't trying and it ain't because like he ain't fast. It's just like when things get a little bit uncomfortable or will he take that chance? Like he did at Anaheim three, where he was like, I will not be denied. And he was denied because he ended up crashing himself. Would he end up being that way? And, um, I think if he ever gets there, it's going to be like a weekend like this. But damn, it was good to see Eli Tomac back. And that's why I say he was on the beast mode because it wasn't fully beast mode. But if beast mode is coming back, we might see Bigfoot this weekend. And at Daytona, we'll know after this weekend where well, your boy's going to be there, by the way. Just saying, your boy's going to be there. Yeah, I, I do feel like, well, I mean, Chase Sexton – Obviously, it was better than it was um, a couple weeks ago. The injury, um, his hand injury. But Chase Sexton, like, I still think he's fine. I mean, I think he I, – I thought when I watched from practice the way he looked, I thought it was Chase Sexton kind of track. And not – like, I did say it was kind of an Eli Tomac kind of track, being like open bowl corners. And when I think of Eli Tomac, I think of speed. So, Jay, how can you say that it's a Chase Sexton type of track as well? Because you say Chase, he, like he ain't going to win by speed. It's going to be different. Well, it was going to be a Chase Sexton type of track. Just why Cooper Webb, the difference was at Phoenix. Cooper Webb was in the same spot, but that track didn't break down at Phoenix. It was still going to be just as fast as it was in that heat race. So it wasn't going to favor towards Cooper where this track – it did favor towards Cooper, like it got slower and it got more technical. And going to Chase Sexton, I believe the way the track and the way his bike set up, it's going to be of a technical lot of turns, you know, the track breaking down, like you start jumping through the whoops. It's going to be more about line selections rather than just going fast. So when I watched the practice, the way Chase looked, I felt like if he got a whole shot, I thought he could win the race straight up. Cole said, miss me with that. But in my mind, I was thinking the reason why Cooper was going to be fine is the same reason why Chase Sexton was going to be fine. And there was really only one person that was going to beat them, and that was kind of Jet Lawrence because he don't really care. Like, he's going to figure it out. Bike don't work. Don't care. Whatever. I'm still young. And I'm still going to go fast. Where other guys, I think, as you get older, circumstances dictate circumstances. And so I thought Chase was going to be good, but they didn't really show him, and I think he ended up like fifth, so. He ended up there. Six. He ended up sixth. You told me fifth earlier. I did, and then I had to check my stats. So that was a f***ing lie. Okay, all right, all right. So I ain't hearing stuff. See, that's a good team. 
the team. He could have probably <laughs> told me six. But he was like, I ain't, I ain't gonna just do him. Now. I can't make him look rad. TV land people appreciate that, Cole. So Chase Sex, he's still fine. He's still fine. Like if he has a couple more weekends like this, then he's still gonna be like he's gonna ride. Like he ain't gonna do much difference on a motorcycle. But I think just as we see guys win races and just by winning the race, their confidence makes them faster. If he ain't winning a race and he's hand still and he's getting like fifth, then I think Chase is gonna be riding the same as he did all year long. But I think he's just gonna be kind of out of the title. And because you just get confidence and you can raise your level and get another half ten, you know, half a second because you just won, that ain't gonna be there. So if he has a couple more races like this, then then I think it's on out to outside for him. And then he'll chalk it up to be next year. But right now, Jet Lawrence hasn't ran away from this thing. And guys are still up and down, which is allowing Chase, while to why he's still injured and trying to get better, like he's still there. And so I think he'd be fine. That was a good race. And uh, I'm, I'm ready to do it again for, uh, for a couple more weeks. Come on. Consistency wins through there again, Aaron, with another visit to the podium. Congratulations. So it's fitting that we are in Jerry's world. It's fitting you're in Dallas, right? Everything's bigger than in Dallas. And even more fitting is that they are the Cowboys, right? So the Cowboy had to show up, which is AP, showed up. And AP... When you want to know, has AP gotten better? I think that heat race kind of tells you all you need to know. Like he was, I think in years past, Eli would have actually ran past him. You know, beast mode, no beast mode. I think Eli being in that zone would have ran past him. But confidence, AP is a different guy. He's feeling good. And he's been pretty dominant in these heat races. Like he, AP's found speed, you know, like he's found speed somewhere. And when the track is open, you know, his roll speed is really good. And with them going first in the heat race, like there's no rut. So he's roll speed. So nonetheless, AP was, AP was riding good. And it wasn't until like the lapper situation that he ended up like getting passed. But AP has been riding that way all year. But I did tell you that the way he's, he could end up winning a championship because of what ended up transpiring in the main event. Like, you heard him on the podium. He's like, no, I, I rode good. Like, I was solid. Bike rode pretty good. Yeah, cowboy. I'm in Dallas Cowboys. I'm doing better than they did. You know, Dak might be up in the stands watching me because, you know, I'm I'm the real cowboy here. Cowboys, you know, you know what I mean? So he was just there. He just rode solid, fast, like he's been doing all year. And, not, and he had the one incident where I did say that consistency, he fall over at Phoenix. But AP's just there. And my point was, is that with other guys going up and down, like he could end up being there in the title and possibly the title threat or winning this thing because of races like this. Like he's just going to be solid when Jet wins and Jet ends up fourth and guys go back up and down. Eli Tomac is b b b b b beast mode. Then like what? Like when he's doing this, AP is going to be just solid. And he's fast enough that when he's out front and things are going right, he can beat you anyway. So no matter what y'all do, he can still outrun y'all, just like he was doing in that heat race when Eli was coming back, crowd was getting wild. Like we thought, oh my gosh, man, it's good to see him. But AP was a lap rider away from still winning that heat race, no matter what was going on. So I think AP is still really good. And I think the whole season ended up, and it was a summary of what happened on Saturday night. Like, he was there, but he wasn't there. And, yeah, Jet was winning, and AP was back there. But somehow, AP ended up scoring more points than Jet at the end of the day. And he was on the podium, and he smiled, and he said, Yee-haw, I'm happy to be here. I didn't do anything different. I rode pretty good. And I got more points, and I closed up the points, and I'm still right here. Well, guys keep making that mistake, and because of AP and how he is, I don't think they worry about him like they probably should be and they probably will be. Like, for instance, if that was Chase Sexton, that would have ended up in that third spot. I think it would have been different. I think guys would look at that differently. The fact is, they Jet probably like, damn, I went down. Yeah, oh, AP, yeah, he beat me, but I still ain't worried about him yet. And AP's just stacking those chips. And I'm telling you, dude, confidence can... 
confidence can do a lot for a man that's actually won a title and that has some speed like he does and his lacks the daisy kind of i wouldn't say lacks the daisy but his his mentality don't mess around don't mess around ap7 might come ap1 and he's right there so ap shout out dude you've been doing what you've been doing all year long except for phoenix and you're doing it good keep messing around let ap hang around like that you're gonna be you're gonna be bull riding all y'all on the way to the that number one plate Yeah, I mean, we had some other guys. We had Jason Anderson. I think he went down. Uh, him and Barsha maybe got into it. Um, you know, he was riding pretty good in the heat race. But I think when you look at him, you could tell they might have to make some kind of changes to the bike because it definitely looks a little soft in the rear. And, for instance, like this type of track where – you can really see guys where you can make up time is because they just go through stuff quicker. And like it was a couple of weeks ago, Jason's kind of struggling getting over those rhythm sections where Austin crashed. When it gets in the backside of his G outs, getting lift, Kawasaki's a little soft in the rear. So they might need to start changing that. But I think Jason rode good. It was, like I said earlier, it was good to see my brother back. Um, I think for, for him, um, I mean, somewhat just like Eli, like they're all fighting for confidence. And, you know, unfortunately, like for Malcolm, it just seems like when things are not going right, you catch every bad break. Like, for instance, like you hit that tough block and that tough block was sitting on top of your bike and it looked like that tough block was like a big old boulder and you like you couldn't pick your bike up, but you kicked that thing and it would flung over like for – and then you go down because somebody's in front of you and they make a mistake and you hit it. When things are not going right, you just get caught up in all that situation. And so for Malcolm, like it was good to watch that heat race because he's like, that's where he should be at. But you can tell at the same time, he's fighting, he's finding confidence in that like every lap that goes through that heat race was a big thing for him. But if I think if things were going right, then he might have actually been able to hold him off or put up more fight. But just like I said with Eli, that the reason I think he would have won that race is because he knows what that would have done for him and done to everyone else. I think he ends up second and it was a win for him. So with Malcolm, when you get to a certain level and things have been like so bad and now you're back up front, you actually pass Jet, you're kind of there. That's a win, which makes you not actually go for the win because you've already you're doing better than you have been and that's a confidence booster so my point is is it's good to see that and i think if he gets back in that situation then a couple more of those then we'll see malcolm before he end up crashing i think he'll like he was in san diego when he caught up to ken he decided he was going to beat ken that's the difference of like as you get more confidence and things aren't going bad he'll get to and I think he wrote the same as he did back in San Diego. I just think the difference is he's been in other spots and he's starting to build. So it's good to see the fever back. And a lot of guys build a lot of confidence going into it. But we had this next guy. Now, this dude, this dude I said a couple weeks ago, he was like, he's the only person that was like mad because the neck burn. Like he won and he was mad because he didn't win, but he won. And he just be mad. Clearly, he'd just be mad because he'd be, like, pointing out things to people that I don't even know. Like, I didn't even know it existed. Like, we have us, like, who, who he, who he, wait, who he talking about? Like, no, dude was on the other side. He'd just be mad. And that's Cooper Webb. And I don't know if Cooper, like, he's happy. But I don't know if he's, like, really happy because, like, yeah, he won the race. But does he feel like he didn't win the race like the way he wanted to win the race? But I said, like, he let Jet go because he knew Jet was going to fall. And that was his whole plan anyway because he knew he was going to win the race. And he knew he was going to end up running the back of Vince Freeze because it seems like everybody runs in the back of Vince Freeze these days. Everybody getting freeze. And Vince ain't doing nothing. He just out there. He probably just trying to stay out of the way. And he's freezing people. So he knew that was going to happen. And he ended up winning the race. And then Jet ended up four. But... Clearly, he wasn't that happy because he was pointing out a situation at the end, like, ah, and I don't know who he was pointing out. Like, I don't even know if people are talking. Has people been saying anything about Cooper Webb? 
about him doing giving the bird. Well, I didn't say he was getting a point. I was just saying he was pointing out fingers, uh, pointing out things. But yeah, like, has people been? Has there been some beef where you would be like, no, side? You know, I, I get the one where he did last year with Chase Sexton when he did him the no no over the in the heat race, but that was because Chase Sexton been the king of the heat races, so he did something nobody else did. So I could see that reason. But damn, I was like, like what? Tupac back? Biggie? They got beef again? What? What happened? But that's Cooper Webb. That's Cooper Webb. Like, he'll make a story up in his head and make the story real. And he'll believe that story because that's what he does. And he, he might be mad because what happened a couple weekends ago at Phoenix, he was up front and then he wasn't up front. And it was nothing he could do. And he probably rode the same as he did this weekend, but he ended up like seventh or eighth. Well, this weekend, because Cooper Webb is Cooper Webb, and I don't, maybe some people get sick and tired of like you saying that. And it's probably hard to quantify when you can't point your finger on why this dude is fast because you say he's not fast, but he ends up crossing the checkered flag first without being the fastest somehow. And he never looks like he's super fast, but he's always right there. Well, people don't like what they can't see. They don't like things that they can't understand. And a lot of people can't understand what makes Cooper Webb Cooper Webb because it ain't like he looks like he's in shape. I mean, he's in shape. He's like probably the most strongest guy. He's always coming at the end. But, you know, he, 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 you know, he ain't like he's got six pack, you know. I mean, maybe he's got six pack, but he just built differently. So you, you look at Chase Sex and you take off his chip like, damn, all right, you know, all right. You see somebody's there like, damn, all right. You see Cooper, you'd be like, all right. But I'd be like, that dude right there, he's probably the fittest dude in this, in this building. And everyone knows that. <laughs> And why they know that is because they know if he's around them in the vicinity and 10 minutes left, if he's within five, six seconds, he's going to be trouble, which makes people change their thing. But they can't figure out why, why he's doing that and how he's doing that because he don't really do anything special. Well, it's just Cooper Webb. And I could tell you over and over, but I don't know if you can see it. But that dude's just ruthless. And fact is, as I said earlier, if it was anyone else in that race, I think Jet would have won. Now, as I said earlier, too, I'm not saying that Jet crashed because he was worried about Cooper Webb. He knew Cooper Webb was back there. I think Jet crashed because, you know, just situations. But when Jet got up and he knew um, the circumstance, I think – Let's just say this. Jet would have been more comfortable if he was anybody else besides Cooper Webb. Let's just say that. So maybe he wouldn't have crashed because maybe he'd have just been like, all right, I'm just going to not jump this jump this time. I don't know. But Cooper brings that presence to where guys react differently. It's like Jason Anderson or Justin Barsh. You just don't leave the inside in. I don't care if they've been to rehab. I don't care if he don't have a gun permit. I don't care if things on safety. Somehow you're going to end up shot. And probation or not, like I said, he got the AMA on Zelle. Like, he don't want to find. He's buying diapers. Like, shoot, he ain't got no money to be, like, you know, paying fines. But, hey, you leave that inside open, I'm going to find him up. So, you just don't do it. And Jet Lawrence is like, when he went in the heat race, he was like, ah, damn. Like, damn. The reason why we knew Jet Lawrence didn't do it on purpose because he was like, who he did it to. You're like, damn, he ain't going to do it to him. I mean, maybe if it was Chase, I might have thought, like, all right, yeah, he probably tried running in on him. But you like, Jason, nah, he ain't trying to get shot now. Why? I mean, Jason probably don't want to mess with him anyway because they, you know, he's a different dude. So don't rile him up. Well, Cooper Webb's that same way. And I just think you watch a guy that's always going to be there, and he's there because of what he believes in his mind, where he sees things in a different way than other people can't see it. And we all try to figure out what makes Cooper Webb so special when there's nothing special about Cooper Webb, but he's always special. That's what makes him special is because his mindset believes he is the greatest of all time. He is more dominant. He is in shape. He's in more shape than everybody. And you can look at that dude and think he's a bodybuilder. And you look at Cooper Webb and Cooper Webb in his mind feel like I'm the world champion of bodybuilding. Whatever it takes to win he figures it out, and I've never really seen somebody that actually can dictate 
things around him like Cooper Webb does. And I know people don't like it. And I know people are like, dude, what is it? That's the point. Nobody knows except for Cooper Webb. And that dude's pretty good. And he's always going to be there. And case in point, when he wins, he ain't happy. And even though he's happy because he's won, he's pointing out things that we didn't even know existed. And what he's going to point out is he's going to point out he's got another victory. And I know out of all the people in this field, that's probably the last one that they want to keep getting victories because they can't figure it out. They just can't figure it out. But what we figured out here is hit it for him, Cole. Suntan, next on fire. See, it worked this time. You got neck burn, Cooper. You got a real neck burn. See, it wasn't delayed because you actually won the race. Like, you won the race. And I'm not even saying that, hey, Jack gave you the race. No, I would never disrespect you that way. Why? Because I don't, I, I don't even know. Like, I just believe when all the things that I see, I'm just going to say that you just playing that out that way. Yeah, you're going to let him go. Like, yeah, you predicted the future. You knew he was going to run. He was going to get freezed. And you were going to win. You knew Beast Mode was going to come up to the pack. And he was going to be all hyped up. But you knew he wasn't going to pass you. And you just know these things. Because you just know these things. And you just know how it ended up. And you end up winning. And I don't know how. I mean, I know how. People don't know how. And that makes them frustrated because they don't know how. But they just know why. And you actually don't even know it makes no sense. Like you. It don't make no sense. But you keep winning, which makes all the sense because you're a two-time champ trying to go for three, trying to turn that number two play into number one, and you're on your way. Cooper Webb, the thing that doesn't make any sense but makes perfect sense, that is Cooper Webb. Psst. I don't know why I did that. It's like a Spider-Man thing. Should we go into 250 class? Psst. We're going to go. Yes. We're going to go into the class. Uh-oh, it's danger time. Danger time. Danger boy. Now, there was a lot of guys that was out doing their thing. I thought Chance Hyman looked pretty good at one point. I thought Tom Vial looked good. They never showed him, but I thought he looked good, even though they never really showed him. And we saw Austin Forkner. Austin came through that heat race like, he was like somewhat beast mode. You could just tell, like, for him, confidence. Confidence breeds a lot of different things. And, man, I, I just, I feel bad for Austin. I'm going to talk about Danger Boy in a second. But I'm going to talk about Austin first. Because that boy hit the ground hard. And it, you just got to think for him. When you, when you think of guys, you know, like I, I appreciate guys that like Austin Forkner. And the reason I appreciate him is because it takes a lot to get up like he does. I mean, yeah, guys crash all the time. I mean, you hear people, all riders talk about, man, they had a big crash during the week. Like, I mean, I don't know how many times I had crashed during the week. So they all tough. But the, I think the difference that separate most of these guys out here is upstairs. The reason why we can't quantify certain things with Cooper Webb is because I think his mind is maybe it's different than a lot of other people. And so my point with Austin Forkner, just like Adam Cincerella, when guys like have incidents and like just these crazy things, somewhat like RJ stuff, like RJ falls, like popcorn man falls, but with these guys, like, they have racing incidents where you be like, I'm not shocked that I saw somebody crash like that, but I'm shocked that it's him. Again, I'm not shocked that somebody gets tangled up going off the start in the heat race at Anaheim 1, but damn, it's him. So for him to, like, keep coming back and make these changes and have another one and then almost probably have, I would say, probably the way he's riding – the best he has maybe his whole career, but for sure, last four or five years, he's back on that form and is finally like, okay, in his mind, okay, to change the Rhino, like for any chance for, for Austin to have any kind of chance, it's the same thing I feel like with Adam Cincerella. For those guys to have any chance, they got to change everything. Like 
you're not going to change teams because Mitch Payton, I think for Austin, like the fact that they committed behind him and he's Kawasaki and Mitch has a great team. So you don't need to change that, but you're going to have to change everything else just to feel like there is something that changed. Otherwise, I think if Austin would have crashed and he would have been in the same program, then I don't even know if it would have hit him as hard as this probably does because you'd be like, all right, maybe I, there's something else I can do to make a difference. Well, when you make this change and you're, you're on form and you're like, dude, I'm gripping with my knees, I'm doing all the right stuff, whatever, and you just feel like that confidence, the way he caught up with Danger Boy and passed him in the heat race, for him to hit the ground like that, it wasn't that he crashed. It's just like the mindset of probably why he's crying if he was aware of what was going on. Probably what hurts Austin the most is the fact that like he probably feels like he can't do anything right. And no matter how confident I am, no matter how many things I do right, no matter how good I am, I just can't get through it. And for those guys to continue to fight back and come back and like line up and go through all the pain that they go through, they get hurt, they work themselves, train, do all this stuff, and then to get hurt again and to do that time and time, I got more respect for those type of riders than probably anybody. Like, I see guys have speed. I see all these guys, but I'm a mental type of guy. I know how hard it is to do what we do. And the fact is, like, to do that when it's just you keep getting knocked down, it is a lot of work to be put in to just get up, just to be knocked back down and to get up again. And those guys continue to do it. It's just a lot of respect. So for Austin Forkner, I'm bummed out. Like, I know like it, it just sucks. It just sucks for him on a personal level. Obviously, um, for our sport, I think it's better – when you have somebody like Austin, because don't make no mistake, like he is, he is a talent. Like he is a rare talent. And just like his old trainer with Robbie Renard, like it's hard to see guys with that much talent, like injuries kind of knock them out to where when they're on, I seen Robbie Renard run past Ricky Carmichael all day long. Ricky would tell you, dude, when that dude was on fire, there was no one that could beat him. It's kind of like when Kevin Wyndham and watch you go, like, dude, I, I can't beat him. I can't beat him. And it's, it comes out of the middle of nowhere. It's because those guys are that good. So Austin coming back and him to hit the ground like that, <clears throat> that was tough to see. And so <sighs> got to give him credit. I mean, yeah, I, I hope it's not as bad as it, it looks. But I think for Austin, it's just more what is mental side of thing. It's going to be his biggest hurdle, probably bigger more than ever. Right now, it's going to be his mental and trying to come back because of all the things that he changed and where he was and um, the level he was on, that just hurts. We go back to, like, what ended up causing the crash. And when I first started this, I said, Danger Boy. And we kind of started in the heat race when, the, you know, Hayden ran it into him. And when Austin was faster and people, some people don't like it, whatever. Well, kind of like with Cooper Webb, I do believe – like Hayden's starting to create a, a sense of like just his presence changes things. And the reason I say that is because you, I mean, you saw how Austin ran past him in the heat race. He ran him down. Like he was clearly faster. Hayden, you know, tried running in, but Hayden was just sticking with him in the main event and it was starting to get later and later. And I, I don't, Austin was faster, but I think Hayden just being there made Austin have to, you know, probably ride harder than he wanted to. And he knew that if Hayden got close to him, that he probably would run it in and probably take him out this time because it's for a main event. So I believe when you watch Austin come out that corner, when those guys were in that sand section, when those guys were getting that double, there was two things happening. When guys were hitting that rhythm section and when you watch Austin come out, there was these guys were doing two different things. A lot of the guys were like landing off that, that single out of that sand section, picking up the front end, and wheeling into that that jump over that little hump and then basically using the the compression of the suspension to rebound to basically hype him up or jump over that next tabletop. And otherwise, if they couldn't do that, then they wouldn't even wheelie. They would actually kind of scrub that jump and actually just use their body weight to like hype, like push them up to so they can get the rebound to go over that double. Well, the reason why I kind of go back to with the, the Hayden thing in his presence. If you watch when Austin's coming out of that corner, like he's spinning, he's spinning and he's still, he's committed. He's going to wheelie, 
but he's, his back tire is spinning. So when you look at him, he doesn't, to, to get that jump, to be able to wheelie into that and let the rebound spring up, you have to have the front end like up high enough to where it actually slaps down to somewhat bottoms out and then the whole bike goes down and it springs up. Well, when Austin's coming out that corner, like he's spinning and he's leaning back and he picks the front end up, but it's only up somewhat halfway to where he probably wants it at. And so what's happening is he start, he's driving forward. So he, even though he's spinning, he's driving forward and he's driving into that jump to where what was going to happen when he gets into it, his bike's not going to react the way he wants it to. So he needed to be up like this, let that thing drop in and that, that little um, that little hole and spring up. Well, when he's spinning, it doesn't drop into it. So it actually goes in and his bike doesn't fully compress. So when it doesn't compress, it actually reacts kind of what we saw with Tomac, um, you know, when he um, blew his Achilles out, it was a dead feeling. And when it gets that feeling, Austin goes through the jump instead of up and in that high speed section, the only way you were going to hit the ground is actually if you went through it to where you didn't get enough height to get over the backside of that tabletop to clip, to get in that, that little goalie to be able to go that triple. Well, Austin actually went through the thing. So he was going forward. And when he clips the, uh, the backside of that jump, throws his weight forward and two things go wrong here. One, the height, he didn't get enough height. He needed to be up more so he can actually get into that that um, that goalie. But I think one of the things that Austin's been really, you know, trying to change this year is with his technique, is by gripping with his gripping with his knees. You know, Rhino has been talking about unlocking hips and gripping with his knees. And that's right. Like, yeah, you want to do it. We talked about Chase. We said some of his crashes. But I believe when you look at Austin, when he lands and he gets kicked, He's still gripping with his knees, so he's still doing what um, Rhino is telling him, form, still correct. But what has been happening with him is, like, as he's doing that, it makes his whole body stiff. And so when his body's stiff, he's locked in on his motorcycle. When his butt gets hit, he's gripping with his legs. It pushes his, all his weight forward. When his, all his weight goes forward, that's when he gets into that, that um, G out part and his hand comes off. Why his hand comes off because all the weight is being pushed up and the only thing that he's holding on is the only thing that's really going forward is his upper body bl blows his hands off. In that situation, the only thing Austin had a chance to do to be able to save it is do the opposite of what he's been told to do. Like he would want to land off that and actually somewhat open his legs to allow his body to absorb that and actually hit the brakes. Like, yeah, you would want to hit the brakes in that spot because otherwise you're going way too fast. Your bike's not set up to hit that, like, clearly, like, your bike ain't, like, two by fours. So the front end ain't going to hold up in that. And if you're holding on by your legs, you're going to get kicked in the rear end, which is the reason why you're in this situation anyway because you didn't get the height. The back end hits you. You're locked in, and all your weight goes forward. What you want to do is almost use your body – to somewhat slow that motorcycle down to where when the bike hits, instead of allowing it to kick in your butt, you want it to allow you to, I guess, kick in your butt, but not be stiff. So it actually hits you and you use your body to like soak it up to where your weight doesn't go forward because that was the only way he was going to save it. So when he doesn't do that and he's locked in on his knees, his whole body goes forward instead of him trying to like soak it up and then the rest is history. So I think for Austin, it was going to be a tough hit anyway. And it all started by him not being able to get the lift that he needed to because he was spinning coming out of the, the, the sand. I think a part of Austin probably wouldn't have went for it if Hayden wouldn't have been as close as he was because Hayden was there and he was closing in. And if he wouldn't have been able to hit that triple, that rhythm section right, Hayden probably would have passed him. So I believe that's why Austin still went for it. So that's where the Hayden being present situation comes in. But nonetheless... It's a lot of things that was happening like really quick and it's easy to Monday quarterback this thing. But in that situation, like you want to you want to do everything to slow down and you want to allow your body to try to help you absorb as much as you can um, this impact that you're about to go. Because being stiff, nothing's going to stop you from that. Like there is nothing you're going to be able to do 
unless besides slowing down and letting your body soak that thing up, there's nothing you got to do. You're going to hit the ground because um, no bike is set up for, and it's kind of a, um, it's a tough situation for Austin to be in. So when he goes down, you can see it coming. Like you can see him out of the sand. You knew he had too much speed into it, but Austin tried his best. There was nothing he was going to do the way he was attacking that. He was going to hit the ground and the rest was history. So it's a tough one for him, but hopefully he's somewhat all right. And, um, but I know this is going to be a hard one physically and mentally for him to come back from. So a lot of people with Austin's crash have been kind of talking about, you know, do we implement some sort of safety feature on the sides of the track? Last year we saw on the opposite uh, sideline, or that was two years ago with Cooper um, kind of going over the bars on that dragon's back and landing right on his back on the concrete. Do you think there's any sort of thing to do um, to make the sides of the track safer? Or, I mean... Uh, yeah, I mean... That's a that's a hard one because yeah, um, I mean I've crashed on concrete. That concrete is crazy slippery. But then when you put like um, plywood there, it's just as bad. I don't know if I mean it's it, there's probably it would seem like okay put bales there. But then what is what's end up happening is that the asterisks and metal medical they can't get to you. Like they can't go over all the dirt and bell. So if you put padding around the racetrack, then the asterisks, they can't get to you. So I think that's part of the reason why it's concrete on the side. Why it just seems like, dude, why is it flat, hard concrete when these guys are going at speed? So I'm assuming that's part of the reason. Um, but yeah, it would just seem like, yeah, you would make it, make it that way. But I'm, I'm thinking that's why they don't do that. So it's going to be a tough one. I, I, you know, the way he hit the ground and, and definitely the way Cooper, you don't, you, you hope that guys aren't like going to end up in that spot, but it's not surprising that they do that. I would think the, the safest thing to do would be change that section to where they don't have as much speed to where, as I was saying, Austin, when, he, I mean, again, even what I was saying, do soaking up with your body, that was going to be a crapshoot. Like that was going to be all luck but there was no chance on the way he was going about it. So for him to end up that way, it was going to happen, but that was because they had so much speed. So as Dirtworks and AMA are changing the whoops, then as I said a couple weeks ago with the corners, like with the start, anytime you have a start that has that angle going into a 90, into a rhythm section, you're going to have two things. You're going to have the Aaron, uh, Evan Ferry hitting the wall, or you're going to have somebody get landed on because somebody doesn't, no, if this other person jumps, blah, blah, blah. So you would just have to change the speed going into a section like that would be the only way I would say is a, a fix that instead of trying to fix once it happens, how do you save it from happening? Like, what do you do with guys flipping over instead of hitting the concrete? Try to prevent that from happening by slowing them down to where I don't think they would end up doing that if they would have, uh, they wouldn't be going in that section as fast as they was because once that happens, they're on for the ride. There's nothing you can really do uh, besides hope and wish and, you know, soak it up. So I think it's the asterisk thing, Cole, is the reason why it's, it's flat. Well, then on that topic, you kind of brought up a good point when I asked you about that pre-show. Um, talk a little bit about uh, why they may have not put him on a backboard because that seemed to be the talk of socials this week of, you know, do you put someone that has – possibly broken back on uh, backboard or have them walk off on their own power. Yeah. Um, yeah, we were talking about that. And I mean, look, the medical people, that's what they do for a living. Like you don't come tell me how to jump a triple. If I won't tell you how to like do your job. Like you would just assume like they know best. Everybody makes mistakes, whatever. And I think what has ended up happening is easy for us to be like, after the fact, dude, he's got a broken back or whatever neck, like, why is he walking? But we don't know what Austin's telling them. And at the end of the day, like, the reason I know that is because I've actually been down there. I've told Dr. Bodner, I am not getting on a backboard. Like, I don't care if my head's in my ass. I don't care. Like, sorry for the language. But really, I didn't want to be on there. And those that's why you hear when when you see the guys go down, you hear the the asterisks or uh, the medical guys like listening in, they're asking them a question. They're asking them what hurts. 
And so when Austin he probably hits his head, like we don't know what he's saying to him. He could be telling them he don't want to get on there. And what are they going to do? Like strap him, like unless the dude's conscious and uh, unconscious and they know that he's out of it and what he says doesn't make sense. They're going to somewhat do what they think they need to do, which is why they probably put him in the neck thing and they try to do his best. But if one of the reasons why they don't, and I don't know the reason, um, if they just didn't do it because they didn't want to do it, then I don't know what to tell you. Then, yeah, maybe that was a mistake. But I'm assuming they probably was kind of listening in and felt like maybe Austin didn't want to do that. He didn't want to be on the backboard or whatever the reason. And, you know, he ends up walking. But again, before everybody can start saying like, ah, oh, they made a mistake. Dude, you got to imagine like all the stuff that's going on. One, is loud as hell down there. And two, you just had a router that somewhat got knocked out. So you don't even really know what he's saying. And nobody, no router wants to be on the back for it. No router, period. I don't care. Like, I can't walk. I hated even riding the asterisk mule back. I wanted to ride back on the motorcycle. Only time I was on there is either I was cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs or literally I knew I couldn't walk because what that says is that I'm done. And for Austin, like, you know, that's the last thing he wants to do. So I wouldn't blame Bodner or Ed Asterix or any of those guys, the medical staff. I think that's what they do for a living and anything they do. I've been down there personally and had to work with those guys and they're the best in the world. That's why they've been there so long. I think the comfort of having Dr. Bodner and the staff, the lecture that we have, we get to see the same faces makes the situations that when Austin's in that makes them feel more comfortable because it's a familiar face. And, um, you know, whether it was a mistake or not a mistake or whatever people are saying, I don't think anything was done to hurt Austin or out of uh, negligence. Like it was more who knows what was being said. I passed the concussion test um, in Indianapolis and don't remember even taking it. And but I passed it. And so, you know, I don't remember talking. So I don't know what we were being saying. But as riders, we are told, don't you get your ass on that asterisk thing because that says you hurt, you did, pretty much. That's the only time riders want to be on that is when they can't. So um, who knows what was being said. But, you know, I think they did the best thing they could for him in the circumstances. And, um, you know, the only people that know was the people down there. Until they say what happens, then I don't know. By the way, it's Alpine Stars medical team now, not asterisk. Yeah, but you said asterisk. Did you say asterisk? Okay. I don't think I did. All right, listen. Alpine Star, I have say asterisk because they were asterisk the whole time, so I apologize for that. No disrespect, people. I know y'all hear me say it. I did say asterisk a lot of times. I'm not going to do like what they do in the, the voiceovers, so I apologize. Alpine Star medical team, they know what's best, and they're happy to be there. So asterisk, they was just in my time, back in my day, so it's easy. My bad. And Danger Boy. Now, we're going to go off a, a sad situation into another situation that, like, the kid's just the kid. And he, he somewhat got a little bit of Cooper Webb in him. You know, like that heat race. Yeah. He ran it in on him. Like, he ran it in. Like, he he was not going to pass him. Like, he went it in to, like, give him a little, you know, look. as Ricky would say, a little elbow grease. You can let elbow grease. He was going to get in a whole tub of grease, whatever. And that was to send a message just to let him know for if you ever got in a situation, next time I get around you, you're going to think that what I just did, because I have no intentions of passing you because I know I can't. And to think that how I believe that played a part in what ends up happening in the main event is probably the reason why he ends up doing it. And most rookies or most He's not a rookie, but most people, and what we said with Hayden, Hayden last year is that his just mind, he would just figure it out. Like, he was just always there, and we saw him in the outdoors, and he had a little baby, and that baby was like, it was born, a star was born, a little devil child, it was born. His attitude is what drives him and makes him, like, dangerous. And when he's not on, because he clearly wasn't on, um, you know, it wasn't that fast in practice, uh, practice and Austin ran him down in the heat race. Most people would be like, ah, man, he's just better. He's just better. And they probably would just go in there and take him out just because, like, they're dumb. But 
I think Hayden just let him like lets those guys know that when I'm in the if I'm in this race, you're gonna have a problem. No matter how much faster you are, I'm always gonna be there. And next time I get it close to you, you might have to worry about this. And that's just impressive because he's figuring out ways to be able to win. And a, a kid being as young as he uh, young as he is, usually as you get older, sometimes you don't have the stuff. That's why they got you know like when the moment's right kind of solutions for you you know what i mean some older 50 feet of it when the moment is right that's why they got those type of things so for him to be able to say i don't need the moments right but when the moment's right i'm gonna dictate what i get like to have that mindset to be able to do that at this young age to be able to figure out how to win still when things aren't going right makes him special over him just being fast because we know how good all these kids are i mean dude half that field out there <laughs> They all look like they're pretty damn good. Like, they all got some style. Chance Hyam is, um, all of them. Like, Matt Nasty, like, he looks good. But when I say there's something about one of these kids and you're waiting for somebody to be dominant, that's what separates, I believe, Hayden sometimes. And it might rub people the wrong way because it ain't for everybody. It ain't for everybody. But it's that Cooper Webb mindset of, like, that just greediness to figure out how to do it because – Hayden got his butt whooped in that that heat race. He he got his butt whooped. And coming in, and yes, he is hurt. Yes, he is hurt. But coming in with as much hype and the injuries slowed that down. But everybody thought it was the way he ended last year. He was going to come in and run through all these guys. And then he had that first race. Things went downhill. And then he came back, and he wasn't that fast in practice on Hayden's standard. And then he's out, you know, leading that heat race and gets ran down. Like, that ain't what he wants to do. And so to him to bounce back in that main event, because Austin was pulling away, but Hayden just kept sticking in, sticking in, and just figured out his way to ride that racetrack and not take too many chances, but ride that racetrack economically, which he had some great lines jumping through the whoops, allowed him to stay there and just figured out how to win. I think Hayden's presence and what he was doing in that heat race probably caused what ended up happening with Austin because he knew if I don't get through this, dude's going to run it in on me, and that's just impressive to me. So as much as Hayden does, you know, as many followers he has, and it's danger time, but on the real, that's what makes that kid special. And that's a rare thing to have at this young age because as I was going, my whole point to all this is that all these guys are good. Like, they're all good. But what separates the really good ones ain't because they, like, can – twist the throttle faster and most people even though they actually do that it's the thing that they can turn their mind off and twist that throttle faster because their mindset make allow them to do that um it, it's special and to have that at this age um it's pretty good because usually you do that when you're older you do that when you don't have speed you got to figure out a different way you do that when maybe the bike's not working good or, or like i was saying with chase sexton like He's going to figure out different ways to win races besides, like, I'm just more talented than him. I'm just going to go faster. Well, guys that can do it in a different uh, varieties is special, and that kid is special. And what he does have, and I didn't realize it until I realized it because the kids won so much, but then I realized he hasn't won that much, was that this was his first time and his first victory. And I feel like we've said this before on this show, which I gave him a neck burn, but I didn't realize I never gave him a neck burn for like this type of win. And to be in this, you know, second race of the season, like he brought himself back into points and he did a mini launch of the motorcycle, favor his dad, tribute to his dad, but he did it the right way. He did it the safety way. It was Hayden Deegan and his first hit it for him, Cole. Suntan, next on fire. I'm feeling dangerous. I'm feeling dangerous. I'm feeling dangerous. He came in on Austin. Austin was like, ah, I'm dangerous. That boy dangerous. But he knew what he was going to do. And when he didn't have his best stuff, he figured out to have his best stuff. And uh, he won. And for people talking about, like, the sensitive, the kid's young. All right, look, like, yeah, like he said last year, I probably wouldn't say that. But I probably did say that. So, whatever. I don't think he means any ill intentions. But, of course, these young fools, they're going to say some young stuff. Dumb stuff, even though I don't even know what he said. Cole was telling me what he said. What did he say, Cole? Well, he basically just said that the pressure gets to you, but he did say also 
um, Hope Austin as well. But he just says, basically, pressure gets to you and welcome to the danger zone. Well, I mean, that's kind of what I was saying in theory about, you know, what happened in that heat race and Hayden running it in and his presence around Austin and, and his presence, he's starting to create that. And I do believe somewhat true. And that's kind of what we've been talking about. I think Austin maybe would have decided not to jump that if Hayden wasn't around. And, and again, what happens in the heat race, Hayden not being as fast. But it was a little like, you know, timing is everything. I would say timing. I don't think what the kid said was wrong. I don't, I think he's, look, we all say things that maybe we should say at a later point. And I think that's the difference. I don't, I don't think Hayden was saying anything like disrespectful to Austin, but at a young age, I think as you get older, you realize when to say certain things. And I think that's maybe where people are probably, they're probably more um, disappointed at the timing rather than what he actually said. Because I think even Austin would probably tell you like, yeah, Hayden was there. So I had to keep pushing. And Hayden felt like he probably saw Austin making mistakes and, because he was there. If he wasn't there, one, he wouldn't have saw it. And then two, probably Austin, uh, maybe, to, maybe, maybe he wouldn't, have, or he would have um, not crashed at that situation. So I don't, I don't, I, I think it's more timing rather than the message that was said. I think Aiden's a young person. And even though I don't, some people, the one thing I, I some people do is like, because you're young, allows like you to like get away with things that you're saying and i'm not saying that what i'm saying is that i think hayden um his message was clear because he is young he probably you know thinking about he's excited won his first race hey welcome to the danger zone like he could be talking about himself like now he's got it these boys in the danger zone because i got my first one um but it doesn't you know it don't get you a pass because you're young i just think you just realize that hey um as you get older, you know the timing of anything. Like the old lady and all the stuff, there's levels and there's timings to everything. Timing is a big thing. And unfortunately, both of them got it wrong. Austin got his timing wrong and Hayden got his wrong too. But that was it. Did you have anything else, Cole? Because I'm going to Stews and Stews because I'm nope. tired. Let's, I got to get, get on the road. got to get on the road. Let's, so Let's roll. All right. We'll be right back, people. Stews and Stews up next. What's up guys, your boy JS7. Look, if you ain't got time to watch our whole video, which I don't know why you don't, make sure you go here and subscribe and check out our new channel where we're gonna have some smaller clips, some clips that you haven't seen on our main show just for y'all. So make sure you subscribe, click, comment, do whatever you do, watch our whole show, but come to this channel as well, check out our stuff. See you there. All right, people, you know what time it is. My favorite time, your favorite time, Stu and stew now first we're gonna make this one a little short because there's a lot of stews out there i mean a lot of these guys stews i mean i think even austin fortner is a stew for it should be on the back brace you know neck brace he did have a neck brace but for him to get up and walk it off and i thought man he was like dead um uh, that's a stew to me because you just get up like you should be dead but you ain't dead too soon no it ain't I, that's not insensitive I'm just i'm that's a stew for reals for reals austin get well soon Anyways, Cooper Webb, Cooper Webb, you a stew because you ain't the fastest. You ain't the fastest. I said this all the time. Like people, they don't like you. Why they don't like you? Because they just don't understand what makes you, you. It's just different. You see the world differently. You see the world in your eyes, the way you want to see it. And in your eyes, you let Jet go because you knew he was going to get freeze. Simple as that. 
and that makes you a stew because you won and he didn't. And that's two. And you pointing out things that we didn't even know to be pointing out. You see things, you make beef, whatever it is, you a stew. And then welcome to the danger zone. Yeah, I ain't gonna lie. I, I mean, I was kind of like, damn, man, like, you know, what's up? Like, what's up? I know he hurt. I know he hurt, but he still be getting no turn downs and stuff. And he still be railing corners. Hey, hey, bro, you be hitting them corners, dog. I ain't gonna lie. You be railing some of those corners. And I'm so I'm like, I'm seeing it, but then I'm not seeing enough. So I was kind of like, whoa, what's going on? But then again, he ran in on Austin. I was like, ah, oh, he'd be all right. He'd be all right. Cause he, he's still feisty. And then he didn't have his best stuff. And he, he kind of knew pressure bust pipes and dude hit the ground. And then we in the danger zone. So Whatever people could say, like it, not say it, what, love it, no say it, too soon, not too soon. Hayden, welcome to the danger zone. And you a stew for that. So, Hayden Deegan, congratulations on the reel. First time ever, always special. You a stew. Now, another one I'm going to give a shout out. It's Hardy Munez. I think I said his name right. When he got, he got hit going into that rhythm section. And when I say all these guys got skills and it's a mental game, Dude, do you see what he did? Could you see the way he got hit? And in that brief second, he made a decision of like, boom, I got hit. First off, it's the worst place to get hit because dude hit him as he was getting on the gas, which makes him get on the gas even more. So he spazzed out like, ah, jumps over cross. He had to make a decision. Okay, like he's going to land on this tough block or he's going to land in the whoop section, but then he's going to be facing backwards. But he like shimmied. Shimmy, he's probably doing the Macarena or whatever. He landed and then just smooth criminal jumped back on the other side and was like, wait, what? Did, did, did. And it was just smooth. So dude's got skills because he had to make a lot of decisions in a quick, a short amount of time. And yeah, you could say he's lucky. Why he was lucky? Because somebody wasn't coming the other way and he didn't get hit by a semi. But he can't, he can't figure that out. He did what he needed to do and he didn't crash. So to me... Hardy, you a stew. I mean, like I said, it would look better in the right type of gear, but still, it was pretty fly. It was pretty fly. I've, but honestly, watch what he does, people. There was no kind of like spazzing out. That dude was in control the whole time. The reason I said he must be from French because they jumped through the whoops. They were very technical. Well, Hardy, he like technical. Like he technical. That was smooth. There was no mistakes. He might have made up time. Anyway, I thought he was going to blast the dude. The dude that hit him didn't even like, he ended up getting passed by the other guy. It was too much going on. I was still confused by what I just saw. It was amazing. So hard, you a Stu. Now, my next list is Stu. Now, is Jet Lawrence Stu? Yeah. Yeah, I think he is a little bit, but then I don't think he really is because he had racing control and some people when you lose you just like yeah like i lost and i think if jet lauren is going to be okay with anything like i do believe he's a racer and i do believe he's like authentic like he wants to if he's gonna get beat he wants people to just beat him straight up but if you're gonna lose you might as well be like well i lost because i decided to jump off the track rather than i got beat so i think mentally he's okay because he realized that that was probably my race i lost it so I don't think he's stewed. He might be a little confused on like what Vince Freeze is keeps in the way for, but then he realizes he's like, well, you know, your bike set up. I can't like stop. What do you want me to do? People think I'm like, well, he lost his mind. He just ran into him. No, what do you want me to do? Stop. So maybe they are confused because they don't know what they're talking about, but you know, and then Cooper Webb, like he is a little confusing, but he ain't stewed. I think he might be stewed. Why? I don't know, because he's still pointing out situations that we don't know, and he's still the only person that can be mad every time he win. But it makes him a stew rather than a stew. So I don't know. Everybody else, Austin Fortner, like, you know, he was probably confused. You know, that's just in general when you hit the concrete that hard, and people like thinking like he should be on neck braids, they probably confused because they were like, I would have been down there. I would have been still laid out. I would have been trying to collect insurance. So why he get up? He should have been collecting insurance. Just pretend like you're going to just die out there. But on the real, Austin, dude, come back. Come back. You're all right. And everybody else, everybody else rode pretty good. I think a lot of guys, AP, he's fine. Beast mode, we coming back. So 
Nobody's stupid, nobody confused. Maybe this segment's confusing, but overall, these guys rode good. And I'm excited to go to Daytona, which you guys should be, because your boy's going to be there. But by the way, we got to have Jet Lawrence pissed off because he gave it away. Cooper Webb pissed off because he got it, but he knew he was going to give it away. So he's just mad because in general. And then it's Beast Mode back. We're going to find out this weekend at round eight from Daytona where it's the Sunshine State. And I believe the sun should be shining. If not, we know mud racing. It doesn't matter because your boy's going to be there. And these guys got to figure it out. Danger boy, pressure bust pipes, son. And you ready to bust some pipes? I feel like Chance Hyman is coming back. Matt Stansty, like, it's Daytona, people. It's Daytona. It's going to be great. So until then, I'll see you guys this weekend. And if I don't see you this weekend, I'll see you next week. What we do here, same place, same time. Now, my ass got to go.